Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Hudson Middle School STEM Night 2020. I am Phil Kupchak, Assistant Principal, and I will be your MC this evening. Let's get our evening started with a few words from our principal, Mr. Musselman. Good evening, Cougar Nation families. Thank you for joining us for our STEM Parent Night. Unlike years in the past, this event is not being held in person, but rather virtually. I know we are obviously aware of why this is necessary. However, it does not lessen the discomfort of not being able to present this information to you in person, nor does it assist with strengthening the connection between our school staff and your family. As many of our staff feel, I too truly miss the opportunity to interact with our parents, families, and school community. While I am disappointed that this event is not being held in person, I want you to know that we have put forth great effort to support you with fostering your child's success. We hope that you find this information valuable. We will begin this evening discussing our vision for math and science instruction at Hudson Middle. We will then go into depth about the academic tracks available for math and science, as well as the various resources available to help our students with their academic endeavors. We will finish up the evening reviewing these expectations, as well as reviewing the District Science Fair project. There will be a discussion board at the end of the presentation that will allow you to post questions. We will review all questions submitted, summarize them, and post answers as a resource for our families to review after this event. Before you conclude for the evening, please be sure to complete the parent feedback survey. This information is vital and will be used as we prepare for family events in the future. Once again, thank you for joining us and choosing to be a member of the Cougar Nation. Have a great night. Thank you, Mr. Musselman. Now I'd like to introduce our math coach, Stephanie Mason. Good evening, Hudson Middle School Krugers, and welcome to the 2020 HMS STEM Night. I'm Stephanie Mason, the math instructional coach here at HMS, and I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share all the new resources we've implemented in our school. I know the last eight months have been like no other experience that we've had before, but our students are working hard, adapting rapidly to our ever-changing environment. But first, before we dive into all the new resources, I want to thank you for your continuing support of our students, of our school, of our staff. You have made all the difference and helped make all these changes possible. The mission of Pasco County Schools is to provide a world-class education for all students by working together Parents and the school community can reach this goal and prepare students for success in college, career, and life. The mission of Hudson Middle School is to provide the necessary environment, opportunities, and strategies to promote students' academic, social, and emotional growth. Through collaboration with our families and community, we will create a safe, respectful, and trusting environment that prepares students for the challenges of high school and society.
Thank you, Mrs. Mason. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Blazik, our science coach. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Hudson Middle School Science. My name is Jim Blazik, and I'm in charge of the science department here at Hudson Middle School. I want to explain some of the things that we're doing in science and our vision. Our vision here at Hudson Middle School for science in just about every class is we expect students to be actively involved, we look towards all our students to be engaged, and we expect our teachers to have engaging activities. And science is one of those things that has lots of engaging activities. Unfortunately, with our current situation in global pandemic, that kind of scales back some of the activities and laboratory things that we do in class. But we're gonna keep it as engaging as possible and follow CDC guidelines to try and do as many activities as we possibly can. Our vision for science is we want to keep students actively engaged and interested in the subject. Our subject changes a lot. Now we have two paths for our science class. One is we have our general path, which covers a lot of different subjects. And I'll go over those in a minute. Our other one is our accelerated path, which takes really quick and heady and speedy through our curriculum. It actually covers the entire sixth grade curriculum in half of a year and half a seventh grade curriculum. Then seventh grade, we get the other half of seventh grade and all of the eighth grade curriculum in seventh grade. So what's that leave us for eighth grade? You're actually gonna take a high school physical science course. A lot of work, great work, but it's gonna keep us going and it's gonna really accelerate our Hudson students. Now, what I'd like to do is show you where are the resources? What can I use to help my student or my student needs help they can help themselves? So let me just show you typically what we see when we go to our, what we'd like to go to first is My Pasco Connect. You sign on to My Pasco Connect and I have a lot of different buttons here, but the one you really want to look at is the My Learning button. We click on the My Learning button, and what it'll show us is all the different, first it'll give us all the awesome different things going on and important announcements. And then as we keep scrolling, what it'll do is it will show us all the different courses that we're enrolled in. Now you're only enrolled in six courses, I have a few more of them, but you'll click on the course. For us, we're gonna click on science. We go to science and this is awesome, guys. This is awesome. This is Mr. Nero's eighth grade science page. And it shows a reoccurring Zoom when Mr. Nero's on Zoom and teaching that class. Some basic course information, how you get through the course. Course expectations, we expect everyone to be ready to learn, respect others and their ideas, and be responsible for ourselves and our own work. Parents, you can create an observer account where you can be part of that class and see exactly what your students see. You can have your own account and go through the modules and go through all the explanations so that you can help your students out. There's also, you can ask your instructor a question, report problems, um, search for different items that you wanna find. Um, Canvas is just super awesome. I wanna switch over to student view here for a second. So this is what your student sees. Sees this is the homepage. We go to announcements. And for instance, I know I work uh, a lot with Mr. Nero's class. He has our learning goals and our announcements, or maybe there's a different Zoom account, or maybe there's something due later on. And what he'll do is he'll put different announcements in here to let our students know exactly what's going on. Those are awesome. In Mr. Nero's class, there's actually a discussion board where every day they have their do now or their warm up question is also available on the web. So if you miss a day, you can still find out what's going on and you can go to the do now. And when we go to the do now, it's really neat. It asks, uh, for instance, on this day on the fourth, what terms from our unit can you use to describe this video? And there's a little video, students watch the video. Um, and then you can even see how some students answer the question. Oh, we talk about atoms, the atoms, I'm sorry. Uh, elephant toothpaste, sodium iodine we talked about. So they can go through these discussions and actually discuss with the whole class. It's almost like uh, in classroom, 
uh, you're just typing this stuff out. No need to raise your hand. You're actually here. You can just blurt it out and other people can make comments. But this is where our expectations, we do expect students to be respectful of others. The modules are really super important. And in this class, you can see here are some modules on that. And this is where it's really great for parents if you have that observer account. There's a welcome page. Uh, get the right browser. I, I believe Canvas only works in Chrome. Uh, finding your course, navigating through um, Canvas, keys to success. If you have any questions, questions and answer. And then as we move down, here's like one of our first units. <clears throat> Properties of matter. It gives us, we can go through classifying matter and students, it tells our students what they should have in their notebook. The right side of our notebook in science is the uh, collection piece, it's the input. On the right side, we're writing down what the teacher tells us. We're writing down our vocabulary. We're writing down our different, um, what we, notes we took from books, things of that side. The left side is the output section. So if you had questions, if your student asked, you, if your teacher asked you to measure something, anything that the teacher needs to see or that a student needs to share ideas or numbers or data, that's on the left side. The right side is the input information I gathered from, from resources. Left side is output, what I'm telling people. As we go through that, it even tells us, you know, write down the goal, classify, gives us a little instructions. Well, we are almost at the end of our evening together. And I just want to thank Mr. Blazik for sharing all that science information about the course. Right now, if you do not have a student who is in an accelerated science course, I would like you to go and fill out our survey. We really need the feedback and we appreciate the feedback so that we can continue to support you, the parents and the families. So if you were to go to the home button and go to quizzes, which will be available to you. And when you get to quizzes, you're gonna click on the parent STEM night survey. There's eight questions. When you get to the parent STEM night survey, it's going to allow you to start the survey. Most of the questions are going to be just true or false. There are a few that are filled in the information to help support us. And so thank you so much for viewing us this evening and joining us for this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, those of you, please, that have a child in the Accelerated Science, stay tuned. Mr. Blazik is going to go over the science fair information. And so you are either A, going to the Parent Night STEM survey, or B, staying in the Zoom to follow Mr. Blazik to the science fair information. And when you are finished with the science fair information, we would also like you to please come here and fill out how the night went for you. So again, thank you families for being with us. We appreciate our time with you. We really do miss all of you and we really do miss doing this in person with you. And hopefully by next year, we'll be able to do all of this together. Thank you and have a wonderful evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jim Blazik, and I'm the science coach here at Hudson Middle School. I'm here to talk to you about the science fair. Every year we host a science fair that's set up to show all the talents of the brilliant young minds we have here at Hudson Middle School. Really enjoy showcasing their ideas, their thoughts, and their experiments. This year, we're gonna do a little bit different than in years past. In years past, we set them all up in the gymnasium or cafeteria and had people come through and take a look and have our students explain what they did. This year, in our changing climate, what we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna to have to do this virtually. You can still have the board if you like, but what we're gonna ask you to do is record yourself in front of the board, explaining your experiment to them. Or I'm gonna show you today a convenient way to where you can just use a PowerPoint presentation, record yourself under five minutes, and then we're gonna 
have you explain your project. And then afterwards, have a judge ask you a few questions about your experiment without having people actually meet face to face. We'll do it via the internet. Let me show you what we plan on doing this year. So this year, what we plan on doing is a PowerPoint. What we're gonna ask our students to do is fill out these slides and while you fill out these slides, complete your, your science fair uh, project, and then record yourself over the top of them explaining each slide. So what I'd like you to do is just follow along with me. The purpose of this template here, which will be available to everybody, is to fill out all the guidelines that our district would like you to have for our science fair. On the bottom of it, we'll have little blue boxes that'll show us our judging criteria. Uh, now note that if you do make it to the district, state, or international competition, you will re be required to have a backboard, but the easy part about that is you can just print these slides off, glue them on your backboard, and it will fill out all of the criteria that you'll need in the future. The first slide should be a creative title for your project with your first and last name. A lot of us just like to put our first name, but we need your first and last name, the teacher who inspired you to get this done, and what period you have this teacher just to help us better sort these out. The title should be creative, but also allow your observer to understand what you're doing your project on. Next is an abstract. An abstract is just a brief 250 words or less description of your project. What it'll include is the purpose, why you decided to do this, procedure, some guidelines as to what you did, data with no graphs, because we don't want to fill this up with graphs. It's just like a one paragraph thing that says, this is what I found out, maybe in numbers, and a conclusion as to whether you were right and what you found out. Uh, for when we do do the boards, the state of Florida has some rules and formats for that. We'll fill that out later. Purpose or your question. We're going to write out our question of what we are testing. <clears throat> we need to identify our independent variable, which is the thing that we changed or did differently, and our dependent variable. What changed as a result of what we, changed, we did with our independent variable? Uh, in writing this, it's a good idea to write it in the form of a question. For instance, what effect does my independent variable have on my dependent variable? Or how will my independent variable affect my dependent variable? A lot of people may use like different liquids on plants. So you might want to say, um, what does the effect of orange juice have on plant growth? Or how will orange juice affect plant growth. That makes it clear and concise and helps the reader or judge understand what your question was. This is a judged criteria right here. So you want to be clear and focused. Identify the contrib contribution to the field of study that we are studying botany. And it's testable. So putting orange juice on plants is testable. So that would fit our criteria. Next is the background information, your research. We're gonna list important facts. It should take us two slides with about four or five facts on each slide. What you wanna do is list something that you found out through reading, maybe watching a video, or talking to a professional. You should also give these people credit. So if you got information from a botanist, you'd wanna let them know that this is what you found out, and this is where you found it out. Like I said, these are two slides, four or five facts, also giving credit to those who gave you those facts. When using websites, it's important that we use credible websites and that we don't just put down vague or generic websites like Google or Wikipedia. You wanna use something that's credible to the scientific community. Hypothesis. We've learned for years and years and years 
as you've been going through science through Hudson School District, that a hypothesis is an educated guess. Well, we educated ourselves through doing the research. Now we're gonna put this in words for our readers. A hypothesis written like this, if, then, this will happen. So generally speaking, like with our plants, if I give plants orange juice, then they will grow taller. And we'll fill in these blanks and give people an idea of what we think will happen. Generally speaking, it should happen because we researched this. Materials. <clears throat> this should be a detailed list. You can use one or more slides if you need to. Um, what you want to also do is remember to include quantities. We want to let the readers know that if they wanted to choose to try this themselves, this is what they're going to need. And we want to give them the exact quantities. If you need two pairs of scissors, if you need 100 milliliters of orange juice, if you need five plants, we have to let people know exactly what we needed to get this done. I like to put it even down to, I needed a pen and paper. Variables. This is a tough one for most of us. We need to make sure we let people know what our independent variable is or what we decided to change. Our dependent variable or what we're measuring or what we're gonna see changed. And a control variable, which is something that is, what I like to say is the normal way or what we compare our results to. Once again, this is a judged criteria right here. The variables and controls are defined, appropriate, and complete. So with our plant example, our independent variable would be giving orange juice to plants. Our dependent variable would be, we hope that plants grow taller. Our control variable would be, we'd have to give one plant water so that we can measure it against and make sure that if there was a change, we know what it was. Procedures. This, is, this can also take more than one slide. You can put it in um, any type of format you want, but it's good to use numbers instead of bullets so we know what is happening. This has to be detailed and it's extremely important because if someone else wants to replicate our experiment, we need to let them know the exact steps that we did so that they can repeat it so that we can't have skipping steps or just assuming that people understand what we're talking about. We need to let them know we gathered our materials, we placed it on a shelf, we put it in sunlight, whatever we did step by step so someone can replicate this and understand exactly what we're doing. Once again, a judge criteria, and it's gonna be judged by how well designed the plan is and that data was collected along the way. Now, there's two types of data that we've collected, and your science teachers probably went over this with you. There's qualitative data. Qualitative data is detailed observations. Generally speaking, qualitative data doesn't have numbers. It's just observations, and we need to use as many adjectives as possible. Our qualitative observation, um, we use our senses and adjectives to tell people what we experienced through this experiment, whether a stain uh, grew larger, whether it felt slimier, whether it smelled stronger, or remember we heard something that was louder. But when we can't measure things, and we want to let people know what's happening. Those are qualitative data. They are observation. Once again, a judge criteria. And it's judged upon whether it's systematic, whether you had some way that you use to collect these observations that your data was reproduced. We always like to reproduce things more than once. And sufficient data was collected so it will support our claims. Once again, what we wanna try and do in all our experiments is make sure we do it more than once. The district likes to see us do things at least five times. I know when you get to high school, they're gonna ask you to do it about 10 times. The more data we can collect, the more accurate we can be. Now, quantitative data, if we break down the word quantitative, it has the word quantity in it. And quantitative data 
and observations usually have measurements or counts, some type of numbers in them. So if we were doing jumping jacks, we could say we jumped 12 times. If we were measuring plants, we could say it grew 20 centimeters. Quantitative data always has a number. Once again, judge criteria, and they're gonna to wanna to look at, was the data collected in a system? Is it able to be reproduced? Did you use the appropriate mathematical and statistical methods? Did you measure correctly? And was there enough data collected? Are we doing this more than one time so that we have a large amount of data that helps us be more accurate? Graft our results and your science teachers and myself will come around and we'll help you graph them. But the important thing about graphs is that they are all labeled and that the graph has a name, the X axis has a title, the Y axis has a title, that they are all labeled in units, and that we use the correct units of measurement so people know when they look at it, whether it was 20 volts, centimeters, grams, degrees Celsius, inches, feet, whatever we're using. And we'll go over that super clearly in, in classroom, but you need to know that those graphs, what we're doing with those is taking our, our data, our numbers, and turning them into a picture so that people can actually see the numbers. This is judged, and it's gonna be judged for clarity and graphics and make sure those legends are in there so that those labels are all there. The appropriate use of math, so if you found averages or your addition and subtraction is correct. And once again, sufficient amount of data. If you collected things at least five times, they're gonna be looking at that too. Results or analysis. This one is really tough for people because we always just want to go to our results and say, I was right or I was wrong. That's not what analysis does. What we try to do in analysis is just take our data, our numbers or our graph and put it in words. What does the data show us? So most often what we try to use is we try to tell people that maybe this one was the tallest, this one was the shortest, what the average was, and what the mode was. Now this is also a judge criteria. What they're gonna do is they're gonna look for your appropriate application of math and statistical methods. That's a mouthful. What they're really saying is, if you're gonna calculate the average, make sure you use the proper equation for that and make sure it's accurate so that they're gonna be double checking you to make sure that if those averages are there, they're correct. The mode is just which one you've seen the most of. Sometimes we don't have a, a good mode, or sometimes you use a mode range. But we're gonna, if you do, we have to make sure those are accurate. And you can check with your science teacher, or even your math teacher will help you. Or, like you said, you can come see Mr. Blazik during the day. I will help you. Conclusion. Conclusion is really cool. Now, this is where we tell people exactly what happened and how successful we were. So what we're gonna do is restate our hypothesis, then tell people was our hypothesis correct and we're gonna use results from our data to tell them that. We're gonna tell people what changes we might make the next time we do this or if we decide to do this and how can our results be applied to everyday life. In our example of plants, we would tell people that my hypothesis that plants would grow taller because they were fed orange juice was Correct, or maybe it was incorrect. The reason I know it was incorrect was, my data shows me the one with orange grew juice, plants with orange juice only grew 20 centimeters. The plants with plain water grew 30 centimeters. Next time if I did this experiment, maybe I would try, instead of a juice, maybe I would try power aid because, well, the athletes drink it. How can your results be applied to everyday life? I would not put orange juice on plants. I would just use plain water. Those are the steps for our science fair project. We're working on them in class. I know all the classrooms are working really hard and I know teachers are helping you out. I'm also available all day. If just let your teacher know, I can come in and help you. Definitely help you with those graphs, how you're collecting your data, 
This PowerPoint will be available online for you so that you can take a look at it. You can download it, you can fill it out, you can use it, record on it. And this could be perfect setup for your science fair project. You can use what was already made for you and just add your personal pieces to it. Also available online is all the paperwork that we've been doing in class that help you walk through how to pick a topic, how to research your topic, how to write a research paper, how to collect your data, all the materials you're gonna use, the procedure you're gonna use, has some graph paper in there if you wanna make graphs, how to write a conclusion, everything is there for you. It's available online. We'll make sure if you don't know how to get it, you can get it from myself, your science teacher. If you see me, you can email me, whatever you need to do. We wanna make sure you are successful because you are the teacher of this one. The whole project centers around you. So let's have an outstanding science fair. I know you guys are gonna do a great job. I apologize that it's virtual, but I'm so sorry about that. But we're gonna make this the best possible project ever. Thank you for your cooperation. If you have any questions, I'll be available after this. You can type me some questions, ask me some questions. I'll get everything out to you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Mr. Blazek, for all that information, and thank everyone for joining us this evening. Please make sure you go into Cam the Canvas course and complete the survey. And as always, work hard and be nice.